1812 is a tiny war by world standards. Both sides are struggling to try and defend their own borders and attack the enemy. The total number of people killed in the war is very small compared to the major wars of the world, and yet it forges the destiny of a continent for 200 years to come. The third generation of the Buster clan faced different challenges from their parents by the time 1800 rolled around. Fifty years after Governor Gooch opened up allocation of land to anyone who could afford it, by 1750 nearly all of Virginian land had been occupied. With this formulated saturation, settlers were left with an aggressive and desperate need to hunt for more. When the consumption of Virginia hit its pinnacle, by 1775 settlers from the Tidewater and Piedmont began pushing past the Blue Ridge Mountains and into modern-day Tennessee and Kentucky. The journey into Kentucky was regarded with heavy concern at the time. In reference to memoirs of Micaiah Tall, Tall wrote, It was dangerous to travel. Whenever travelers or movers attempted to pass through the wilderness in small numbers, they were almost certain to be attacked, robbed, and murdered by small straggling parties of white people and Indians. He further explained the preparations for the journey with the outfit consisting of bread and meat enough for five or six days being put into a wallet or a canvas bag, the young horse being well fatted. The perils did not end at the desired destination. Micaiah Tall's uncle died after purchasing land from Governor Shelby, and one of his brothers drowned in Kentucky River right before the end of the 1700s. After Daniel Boone shepherded the westward trails from Virginia into Kentucky, the migration overflowed. This competitive strand prolonged the undeclared wars with the people who already inhabited the land, especially in the Ohio Valley, which would carry well into the War of 1812. By the time a strand of busters rooted themselves in Pulaski and Wayne counties of Kentucky, the two wars between Britain and the Shawnee with their allies enforced a stronger sense of American nationality than the previous wars. It was the American version of their crusades, where religion was used to justify the conquering of unfamiliar lands. It was that. And it also was another way of redefining an American version of England's old plantation of ulcer settlements. More so in the South, when plantations transformed from medieval serfdom into modern slavery, taking the concept of the planter who is the owner of the land, the master, and planting labors for the benefit of a segregated society. General and Senator Joshua A. Buster comprised these two ideologies. He was both the crusader and planter, whether inadvertently or unconsciously, like one of those spokes attached to a working wheel. Undeniably a product of his time, Joshua's history could be outlined with a single lineage whose version, likewise, was narrowed into a single horizon, even with the best intentions. Grandson of William Jr., Joshua was born in Lunden County, Virginia on April 8, 1793, next to a thriving and urbanized Alexandria. His father Charles moved the family to Wayne County sometime between the years of 1800 to 1802. They settled in Monticello just shortly after the Northwest Indian War when General Mad Anthony Wayne, the Revolutionary War hero in which the county was named after in 1800, suppressed the ongoing Native American struggles for a time. The reason for the move to this particular spot in Kentucky may have been inspired by Joshua's mother's side of the family. His mother, Sarah Jones, alongside of his grandfather and uncle, all relocated to Wayne County, although not simultaneously. His uncle James, who married his Aunt Mary Buster, arrived first, then his grandfather, Joshua Jones, and later his father. With the Kentuckian borders open since entering the Union in 1792, not only was Virginia no longer considered the West, but the expansion of slavery also went westward. Colonel Bland commented about his new territory during the Revolutionary War. There is a place called Kentucky whose soil is extremely fruitful. The immigration of the people to that place is amazing, seeking thereby to escape the tyranny and oppression of the Congress and its upstart dependents.
So, in returning to Joshua's Buster's story, he was eight years old when his father passed away at the age of 36. Explanations unidentified, perhaps due to an infection, malaria, or other waterborne diseases. No will had been recorded, therefore indicating his death was sudden, and that Charles may not had much to pass along to his family other than a horse and some farmland. This devastating experience would affect how Joshua sympathized with widowers and orphans from the Mexican-American War down the road. His mother Sarah, having five children between the ages from 4 to 13 at the time of 1802, did remarry two years later to John Sanders, who was also a widower. Depending on which family tree is studied, Sanders had anywhere of half a dozen to a dozen children. The couple did manage to have three more children in addition to. The next eight years regarding Joshua's life can only pass in our imagination, although imagining a crowded house of 11 people is a good start. When he was 14 years old, a land grant of 84 acres was taken out in his name. It was unlikely he obtained the funds to do so himself, therefore, the more probable explanation would have been his grandfather, Joshua Jones, to help the young boy get set up in his life since his stepfather would obviously focus more on his biological children. The environment young Joshua grew up in not only extended the backwoods of Virginian culture, but also developed into a Kentuckian one. The population of Wayne County consisted principally of immigrants from Western Virginia and East Tennessee, wrote lawyer Micaiah Tall, future U.S. representative of Kentucky. There were a rough hardy race of men, very large and stout, and although an excellent population for a new country, everybody came to court and the day was spent drinking, fighting, and jollying just for fun. It perpetuated an acutely masculine culture. Women had few public places to enter that was considered socially acceptable, church and shopping at the mercantile. Most often they would have been escorted by another person, whether male or female, but hardly alone. The coming of age for Joshua meant stretching out freedoms his sisters would never have the opportunities to claim. And being born into a well-to-do family, both from his mother's side and stepfather, arose more opportunities than his fellow neighbors in his community, and more so than the people in his family, and later himself, would own. The political upheavals did not end in 1783 with the conclusion of the American Revolutionary War. While the newly formed United States struggled to reconstruct its government, France's political instability inadvertently welcomed the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, much to England's dread. The war between France and England infringed on Americans' maritime commerce, not to mention the split among American loyalties between the British and French. When Thomas Jefferson was president, his pro-French views made the situation worse in his policies. But then, England's disregard for Americans' trade while abducting American sailors did not win the country an award for miscongeniality. So, it was no surprise when the War of 1812 was declared by Jefferson's successor, President James Madison, the dispute was more like a pugilistic fight than a fight about sovereignty. The British as they had done so during the French and Indian War and the War of Independence, supplied weapons to the indigenous tribes as a means to attack the Americans in their backyards in order to weaken their Anglo cousins, as if drawing a knife into a fistfight. Of course, the natives in turn took advantage of these European disputes to benefit them as well. Joshua Buster had only been 19 for a couple of months when he joined as a private for the 7th Kentucky Militia Regiment in late August under the command of Colonel Joshua Barbie and Captain Micaiah Tall, also known as Barbie's Militia. The fervor caught like wildfire. Not quite 20 years since the strong loyalty emotions inspired people to volunteer and defend a crusader's cause. It may not have been a religious war, but a war guided by religious beliefs, defended by a righteous morality. Joshua's two uncles, James Jones and William Jones, and cousin John, Jonathan Woods, Buster, all joined the 7th Regiment as privates as well. All were to serve six months. Following the orders of General Henry Harrison, Joshua's regiment intended to head off to Indiana where they were required to serve three months protecting the outmost frontier against the Shawnee. But by the time they reached to Danville, Kentucky, after marching almost 70 miles, they were unexpectedly ordered to change their course 
northwest as a result of Detroit falling into the hands of the British. The mood, understandably so, was solemn. And this war not only was about battling the British again, it was also an extension from Lord Dunmore's war, competing with Ohio natives and Shawnee for the Ohio Valley, developing into what is now famously called Tecumseh's War, to which Tecumseh allied his tribe with the British and helped defeat the Americans in Detroit. Joshua's regiment advanced onward to Ohio and stayed for the winter at St. Mary's, near Piqua, a tiny frontier settlement not far off from where Tecumseh was born. During their march through Dayton, an old Irish or Scot-Irish woman and her daughter provided buttermilk for the men. Captain Tall recorded the conversation with the woman in a nostalgic tone. You are from Kentucky, gentlemen, said she. Yes, madam, was the answer. May God bless ye and prosper ye, she said, and give ye health and strength to defend the country. Brave Kentuckians, she said, we know you are real men of stout hearts who will not run and leave the frontier unprotected like our own cowardly men have done. The 7th Regiment did not engage in battle, surprisingly enough, but instead were used to escort and defend the provisions for other troops who engaged in battle, mainly against the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Chippewa, Mohawks, and others, rather than the British. The boredom proved to be just as much as a hardship as anything else. One incident Captain Tall mentioned in his memoir in reference to this frustrating dilemma was with a commander from Ohio, Colonel Jennings. Whether Joshua was with Tall when the captain was ordered by Colonel Barbie to check on the safety of the men at Jennings' encampment is not known because he didn't mention his soldiers by name. However, the incident still reveals a sense of desperation and angst Joshua may have endured. When Captain Tall arrived at the raw fort constructed of logs, he discovered the men, although safe from enemies' harm, were without tents and other camp equipment, including rations. The men at the encampment, under the order of Colonel Jennings, were waiting for the return of empty wagons from Fort Defiance, which was the reason they hadn't moved on to help supply St. Mary's. When Tall informed Jennings they were to return to St. Mary's after confirming their safety, the Colonel insisted they should stay despite a written order from Colonel Barbie. In his memoir, he admitted this Colonel was not popular with his men, unintentionally describing Jennings' state of mind as vain rather than depressed. As Captain Tall's regiment was leaving, he found the colonel sitting on a stump, watching them, still waiting for the empty wagons to arrive, and doing nothing else. As I passed, I saluted him respectfully, Tall explained, and bade him a good morning. Where are you going? said he. To St. Mary's. By what authority? By the authority of the written order of Colonel Barbe that I showed you last evening. I command you to remain until I countermand that order. Excuse me, Colonel, I have not the time, was my reply, and I marched on. For a time, things did not get better for Joshua's regiment. Four months into his service, already extending over three months promised by General Harrison, it snowed two feet and froze the river. They constructed a stockade by themselves, but their clothing, made of linen or cotton, hunting shirts with pantaloons, which were being worn thin, were not prepared for the approaching winter. Just before Christmas, the patriotic ladies of Kentucky were encouraged by Governor Shelby to help supply the men with more clothing and blankets. Boredom was countered by building log cabins and gaming. When the roads opened, citizens from Ohio brought them in butter, vegetables, and poultry. A shipment of supplies arrived by early winter when the snows melted. Once again, they had to march to Fort Jennings to provide the supplies to the other troops, and several men became fatally ill during this period. Captain Tall confessed, Nothing very material could at a post during the winter. We had the same unpleasant, uninteresting round of escorting convoys of provisions to the troops in advance of us, particularly Fort Wayne, Fort Jennings, and Fort Defiance. Because of a harsh winter and the extremely painful boredom, there often were deserters and a once attempted mutiny that was swiftly put out. Obviously, Joshua Buster was not among them and was more in the line of a noble set of men in Tall's company. Of course, having family in the same unit had to have helped a great deal. When March finally arrived, concluding the six months allegiance, the regiment hiked to Cincinnati, many meeting friends and family there, a hundred miles from Wayne County, and then returned to Monticello. 
Three weeks after the reunion, a barbecue was hosted by the citizens of Wayne County in honor of the men's service. Three months later, Captain Tall would again serve and would soon be promoted to colonel. Joshua hadn't been to idle at this time before being appointed Brigadier General by 1814, but unfortunately, not much more is known in the course of a year's passing. He was in charge of the 16th Brigade Kentucky Militia a year after his return from Ohio, and yet how he jumped from a private to a Brigadier General leads to speculate his connections. Of course, Joshua Buster had to have had the smarts and the ambition to make the high jump in a short time frame in the first place. And of course, it was during a time of war too. But without his mother's side of the family associations, the ladder he would have to climb would have taken him half a lifetime otherwise. That association was conceivably with, with Micaiah Tall, former lawyer and militia leader.